Hello, colleagues. Hello, Catherine. Hey, Katerina. Hey, everyone. Hey. Um, thank you for joining us. And uh, hello, colleagues who have joined us recently or who have been staying with us from the previous talk. It's a BA Excellence Conference, and we continue our sessions. Uh, and our next speaker is Catherine. Uh, she is a business analyst, team leader, and manager at EPAM Systems and has worked in IT application delivery for large enterprises for more than 10 years. Uh, Catherine will, uh, will hold our next session on the topic Accelerating Business Analysis, Embracing Artificial Intelligence as an Agent of Change. Hi, Catherine, one more time. Hey, Katerina. And I want to say good morning to those uh, in the Western Hemisphere in Canada, US, or LATAM, and or good afternoon, good evening for those who may be joining us on the other side of the planet Earth. I'm very excited to be here with you today and getting to talk about a, an, an aspect of technology and disruption that I'm really passionate about. So I think uh, let's have uh, hopefully an interesting talk. I think that um, certainly it's been a fun time experimenting on uh, using ChatGPT, generative AI over the last uh, some months for some of us or a little bit longer for others and seeing how this could potentially accelerate our BA work. So. <laughs> And uh, we have already received many answers to questions about how and where colleagues use AI for work, for projects, and etc. And how have you used AI for non-BA and non-project activities? It's actually, that's actually a really interesting question because, you know, what some of the first things you do is you try your work. You try using it in a professional context, but actually the most fun and actually the most educational has been trying it in non-work contexts. So I use it for general questions and research. So for example, I had someone coming over for dinner with some dietary restrictions and I started asking ChatGPT, well, I want to serve a fish dish. What side dishes would be good with this? Oh, wait, I forgot. They, uh, they're they allergic to lemon and citrus. So ChatGPT gave me a revised um, suggested menu for that event. So there's some fun ways where you can adapt and use it. Lately, also, I started using it as a motivational fitness and health coach. So it's very encouraging. I've asked it to be, you know, extra positive and inspiring. And even some other things, I write blog posts uh, and share it with my family. And I actually trained it on my writing style and my sense of humor. And I've experimented with it in terms of if it could emulate my voice. I don't think it's quite there yet, but it's actually pretty exciting to see what it could already do. And that adds a bit of inspiration. So certainly been experimenting with it outside of the BA and work context. Thanks. And I know that a lot of people are trying to use, uh, for example, ChatGPT for traveling planning activities. So just create a plan how I can travel between some dates and I would like to um, see some uh, seasides or something interesting. So it's also like one use case for us. <laughs> Absolutely. And actually, my care, my hairdresser never heard of chat DPT. His job is probably not going to be disrupted by AI directly, but he didn't know what it was. And actually, I said, well, what's the pain point you have? And he's like, well, I'm trying to figure out my next holiday vacation destination. And I said, well, why don't we use chat GPT to help? And he's like, what? How do you use it? I'm like, don't worry. I'll, I'll walk you through. I'll walk you through it. And actually, we're able to enter his preferences and what we're looking for, and got a list of recommended locations to visit and and an overview of what the weather would be like. Um, and he said that actually saved me a lot of time and gave me some good ideas. So actually, booking and planning travel is a great use case. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So uh, I suppose that we can start our event and um, some small intro. So during our session, Catherine and our audience will come through the path from early experimentation to AI native proficiency. Uh, we will explore the stages of disruption and opportunity and uh, preview our roles as a business analyst in an AI team uh, of the future. And uh, a couple of additional uh, small moments from our Global BA community site. Uh, the session is being recorded and the recording will be available a couple of days after the end of the session. And after our presentation, we will have an Q&A session and you can send questions to the chat or leave them uh, on the agenda page. So feel free to ask your questions or express your opinion. And now I suppose that we can start. And Catherine, the floor is yours. Thanks, Katerina. And for those who just joined in, welcome. Glad to have you here today um, and hopefully 
uh, participate in a conversation. Would love to have some Q&A with you about a topic I'm very, very passionate about. Um, Katerina shared a little bit about me. Um, I'm located up in Canada, which is not the cold white north uh, as it typically is. It's summer, it's hot, it's hot and humid outside, but we're here today to just come together and learn something. Um, so a little bit about me, as mentioned, I've, I've been with EPAM for over 11 years. So I've been practicing mainly as a BA, but wearing different hats. And maybe a little bit of something a lot of people don't know is I'm an, act, I'm an avid sailor and DIYer. So my husband and I own a sailboat that's over 30 years old. So if I'm not at work at a computer, I'm actually probably at the boat, uh, either sailing it on the water or refitting it with power tools and electrical and the whole thing. So I enjoy tinkering. Um, with things, whether it's AI related or not. But in particular today, I just wanna share some of the things that I've been learning and been thinking about working with my colleagues at EPAM um, and trying to address and investigate over the last uh, some months in exploring the opportunities that AI presents, how it's disrupting ourselves, our customers, and in particular, how we need to look at business analysis in the future. And that's an evolving question. So whenever I like to talk about AI, I always ask people, when was that moment? Where were you when? When was that moment when you first started playing with some form of generated AI or some AI tool and the light bulb goes off and you realize this isn't a chat bot. This is actually generative. Um, it's very high value. It's potentially pros as some interesting results, but overall very high quality. And for me, that was, um, early this year, back in January, I was aware of ChatGPT. I was talking with some colleagues about who were experimenting with it, but I really got hands-on around then. And this is actually a screenshot from one of my very first sessions and I asked it to generate a user story and acceptance criteria. And that moment for me was when I realized it could pass an initial phase of an interview. This is a fairly reasonable breakdown of a particular requirement for a payment gateway integration. So Reflect on your moment. When was that moment when you realized what AI could do for you or what it could mean for business analysis, IT development, um, and also just the market and the broader world in general? And it could have actually spawned a lot of feelings. Um, potentially we're really excited about how much time you could save. That was definitely my first reaction because I was in the middle of a little bit of drudgery work and I'm looking at the potential of these tools. But then you start thinking as it sets in, well, if this tool can do what I can do, you start to get a little worried about job security, right? And the kind of work we do um, is potentially in the crosshairs for heavy disruption by AI. And then also at the same point as you're worrying about, well, what am I gonna do tomorrow? You think about how many years did it take me to get to this point where I could write user stories and acceptance criteria with confidence and quickly and hopefully completely, or at least know you can ask the right questions to ensure that you've captured those requirements entirely. And then ultimately all these feelings come together in that realization that this is a massive disruption wave. There's certainly a hype wave, absolutely. Um, but we're all here at this conference and having these conversations globally because we realize that this is a disruptive wave caused by gender AI and AI tools. And there's no real going back. The Pandora's box is opened. So reflect on those feelings and try to remember where were you when, when you first had these realizations. But for what we're going to go into today, I um, want to touch on a few topics. Um, as Katarina was mentioning, I want to tackle the concept of paradigms and what really is potentially those challenges that AI poses against the paradigms that us as business analysts hold. And taking advantage of those opportunities that the AI tools bring, let's see how it can accelerate the work that we do. And I'm gonna take a crystal ball stab and make some predictions about what the BA role could look like in the future, and then share some thoughts and some takeaways, and hopefully we can have some insightful Q&A afterwards. So please leave your questions or comments in the chat. We'd love to hear from you in chat. So first off, let's talk about paradigms, and I'm gonna share this in the form of a story, but first, like all good business analysts, let's start with a definition. So a paradigm is really a conceptual framework. It's a, it's a model and it's a common understanding um, for a particular field or discipline. Um, it can be a set of assumptions, that common sense aspect, values, maybe specific practices. Often it's how something should be done. Um, but the key, the key hallmark of a paradigm is something that's resistant to change. It doesn't change quickly. Um, so certainly, you know, there's been evolutions in the past. You could say a past paradigm was the classic one teacher, 20 students models. The students memorize all the information and write it on the test. And that was education. That obviously educational paradigms have shifted over the years. 
or even a more long held paradigm of you need to be in the office to be effective. Now that's actually a paradigm I think that's still be evolving, but COVID certainly proved that we can deliver and we can collaborate successfully decentralized and remotely. And so that's something that's an evolving paradigm about do we need to be in the office or not? So those are just a few examples. But before I go into my, my story about when I had a bit of a paradigm shakeup. I got to give a bit more context. So we shared my professional credentials, but I'll go a bit more deeper here. I confess I'm a millennial, so classically digitally native according to the demographics. But what does this mean in terms of my background? Um, top left, I remember having uh, Encyclopedia Britannica on the bookshelves and opening them up and researching and photocopying those pages for school assignments. I remember, you know, going to the library and dealing with the cards and so forth. But then also the evolution of the internet, the desktop computer in the house, the digital encyclopedia that comes available, having the first laptop in high school. Um, so getting used to using all those digital tools and so forth and adapting to those ways of working. And of course, search wasn't quite, uh, you know, robust back then, but it was available. There was access to knowledge globally and we had the ability to communicate um, between every between everyone, emails and so forth. So a bit of a digital native background, but certainly with a foot um, in in how we used to do things. And in part, this created some paradigms for me. Um, was a studious student, tried not to break any rules, tried to do everything thoroughly, tried to get 100% on every test um, and so forth. But when I was approaching re projects, I had a few paradigms. The first is that you sh I should only ever use trusted and known sources, the best sources, so the encyclopedia, um, you know, books written by historians, those kinds of things that were available, they were trusted, they were citable in a bibliography. Uh, so, you know, information on the internet, not so trusted because people could post anything, especially with tools like Wikipedia and so forth. And then also because the studious student, you know, not taking shortcuts, the hard route is the right route. Um, you need to put in the elbow grease and the sweat in order to do your research right um, and be thorough enough. And this actually served me well. Um, it did very well for a long time, but it didn't last forever. And actually that paradigm became a mental trap. Um, that paradigm about limiting myself to trusted sources led me to researching an American history topic in the library for over an hour, going through the, going through the books, trying to find out anything about this little assignment topic that I was given um, and trying to just get a starting point, find that first book that at least does a summary that tells me what this thing is so I can do some follow-up expansive research. And it was very frustrating. But thankfully, I got an outside kick. So our librarian at our school, Mr. Williams, he saw me struggling in the library during my work period. And he asked me what I was doing and explained I was looking up this particular topic on American history. And he said, OK, Catherine, you've been at this for an hour. I've seen you struggle. So a librarian who would typically you'd expect to say, look at, you know, books, only use trusted sources, said, you should be using Wikipedia. Why aren't you using Wikipedia to start your research? And I said, well, it's not, it's not a trusted source. Anyone could put anything up there. Um, it's not validated. Yeah, they cite things, but anything could be, there could be any, um, any author for this content. And his advice was, don't get stuck in the mud. You have to start somewhere. So don't ignore that Wikipedia is probably very valuable and is one click away. <laughs> Um, and actually it could at least help you get started and not limiting yourself. So don't limit yourself to the tools you know. And then he, the suggestion was a wise one. You don't 100% trust the source, and I agree. Research, use it to start your research. Then with a, knowing a bit more than you did five minutes ago, now you have more information to go dig up additional sources that are more reputable. Then you can actually, cor you can actually cor correlate it with sources that you trust. So in your bibliography on that, essay, you're not going to write Wikipedia, you will write your trusted sources, but underneath Wikipedia helped get you started. And I think that hearing this from a librarian was a bit mind blowing for me, uh, but certainly it was important. And that mind blowing aspect was actually the feeling of a paradigm shift. And I felt a little sheepish. I was like, I wasted time, but it was a fundamental change in my approach and underlying assumptions and how I did research. So I went from this paradigm of only use trusted sources, only you know put the hard work in and so forth, don't take shortcuts, to, well, the librarian says it's okay, but actually really, it means that 
research widely, don't turn down sources of information just because you might not 100% trust them, but apply critical thinking skills. Evaluate the what you find, try to dig through to address the truth, or at least um, work get as close as you can to the full truth. And then if you're stuck, worst comes to worst, try something new. Um, and this is something I've tried to take forward in my work as well. Um, and certainly with AI, that's something that we want to keep in mind. Because in this case, this was a mental paradigm of using some of the websites and tools available on the internet. And now there's a new wave of tools and we don't 100% trust them, but we're being faced with the same challenges. Do we continue being in the library for essentially for an hour, doing things the long way, or do we potentially try to embrace um, and accept the fact that there might be a paradigm shift required in order to um, leverage these tools, even though we have to do so responsibly? So let's talk about how AI challenges the BA paradigm specifically. And I've been talking with a lot with my BA team and BA leaders uh, across EPAM, and oftentimes we get a lot of questions. And the questions can be, well, how can AI help me? Right? I hear about these tools, I see the articles, but how does this actually really help improve the quality of my work? I'm a professional. I know how to do good requirements and work with my team members and stakeholders. So how can it help me? Or okay, if this is a thing, what new skills do I need to learn? Potentially, how do I deliver better value? I don't want to use a new tool just because it's new. How does this actually deliver more value to your customers and your teams? And this is an important question. How can I use this technology responsibly? We don't 100% trust it. I want to be responsible for my own work and be able to explain my reasoning and thinking when I um, do my work as a business analyst. So how do I use this responsibly? And then as a longer term question is, does this change my role in the team? Does, is this just something that'll be one more tool in the toolkit and one more application on my desktop or my laptop? Or is this actually something that might change my, change my ways of working? And it's very good to see. This is a great mindset already from our BA team. We always ask questions. We always want to learn more. Um, so asking these questions about, this, about these new technologies, and how we can apply them is already a very healthy sign from the team. But even so, it's not necessarily indicative of a paradigm shift. So when I, whenever you're sort of faced with an uncertainty unknown, it's always helpful to go back to those basics. And for business analysis, what's more basic than the definition of business analysis from the BABOC? Um, that practice of enabling change in organizational context, defining needs, recommending solutions that delivers value to stakeholders. And there's a lot of keywords in that. And I won't break down the definition here, but the key piece to call out is that this is the definition of our practice and what we're really trying to do. But we have established ways of working of doing it. Obviously speaking, we have different techniques and diagrams we use and so forth, but it's not actually prescriptive about the tools we use. It doesn't say use Microsoft Visio for diagrams. It doesn't say use Lucidchart or Miro or MS Project for planning. It's, it's a little broader than that. But even so, there's a lot of activities and established patterns about how we accomplish these tasks. And that's built by our experience, how we were taught by other BAs, how our organizations do this, our preferred ways of working, and how we engage with stakeholders, ultimately get to documentation of requirements and the as is and to be and so forth. But where this gets interesting is a sort of indicative about the questions the team was raising. And it's I think that sort of underscores what makes us a little bit potentially uncomfortable about this. Because like the earlier example I showed, the tool was able to define some requirements. It was able to help define at least the functional requirements for, in that, in that case, integrating a payment gateway. You can write a problem statement. Like I was talking earlier, my, uh, the, my hairdresser was asking, I don't know how to, I have some needs. I need to go on vacation, but I, it's ambiguous. I don't really know what I want to do. And the software is able actually to accelerate that and able to do it without the input of an expert, just who was able to ask it directly. And then even recommend solutions, um, recommending a breakdown of requirements, recommending questions to ask, recommending potential patterns. These are areas where there's really a potential for disruption with AI. So the question is, if this, if AI can actually sort of take on a lot of these tasks, then what does it mean being a good business analyst? What are we actually doing in this? And our ways of working to perform these activities and so forth, if that's changing, then how do we adapt to those changing um, ways of working? So let's think about specifically, how does this 
maybe change what we're doing as BAs. So first off, change is not actually a single point in time or a single instance. Our ways of working are always changing. There's some probably on this call have been being practicing BAs for longer than I have and others who've been for shorter. But even the period I've been working as a BA, our tools and our, and our ways of working have been evolving. The adoption of Agile, using more, um, using Power BI data analytics, using to going from a simple Word document where you're writing a whole SRS, SDS, now we're using Jira, we're using more collaborative tools, the Atlassian suite, documenting real time with stakeholders and other BAs and tech leads and bringing together common visions and understanding. And even the solutions themselves have changed. Um, the platforms have evolved. So what we can actually propose as those recommended solutions has evolved as well. And of course, we have to call out the collaboration. Our methods of collaboration have rapidly evolved over the last few years. I remember dialing in using a card on a polycom and listening to really bad uh, audio connection with anyone who wasn't in the room. And now it's nothing to just turn on your webcam and have a call with 20, 30 people, do a big workshop virtually, and actually deliver a lot of value with that. So again, we do have to accept that AI is not the only change. We've actually always faced change. And whether or not you're directly playing with the tools, you do need to be aware that all these platforms are integrating generative AI into their solutions, all of them. And if they haven't announced it, they will announce it soon. Um, and that's something to be cognizant about, that sometimes leveraging these new tools is going to be more or less transparent, depending on the case. So to say, I'm not going to use AI because I'm going to be a good business analyst and do things the way I do, is not necessarily an accurate statement because our tools are changing under our feet. So it's important to be aware about how these are evolving and how we can best leverage it in our work. So I'm going to... That's sort of some aspirational pieces, but let, let's try to start making this real. And we have some initial value hypotheses. You know, how can we start? How can we start today to bring acceleration our BA work? Not five years from now, that's that's gonna come, but what can we do today? And the first thing I suggest to my teams is you can consider it like a brainstorming assistant. Ultimately, we're still responsible for our own work, but like a good brainstorm, you get good ideas and bad ideas, and then it's up to you as a business analyst to filter it out and use it. Use it as a jumpstart. Use it to accelerate your own work and that difficult first draft of requirements or materials and so forth. Um, and that can actually potentially save a lot of time. Access to general knowledge. If you, there's an area you're not as familiar with and your stakeholders are not available, maybe query it a bit. It might help enhance your general knowledge so that you can actually maybe ask more insightful questions and save a bit of time for the conversations that matter. But I put that with an asterisk because current with the current tools, they're you do have to take it with a grain of salt, at least, especially when you get into the edge and niche cases, of course. And the last one, which may be the most exciting, is accelerating those routine tasks. How many of us have actually written emails, you know, half an hour, doing a nice, beautiful summary of meeting minutes, following a meeting with action items, the points discussed, the agreements, and so forth. So even that can be accelerated. Or even translating requirements from one format into another, from one document provided to you by stakeholder into a format that can be used by other members of the team. So some of these tasks can actually already be accelerated. And that's our hypotheses. By decreasing the time for a lot of these different activities, we can actually increase the quality of our work um, because we can actually focus on what really matters. But I do need to emphasize, like Mr. Williams, librarian was telling me, we need to apply our critical thinking and best practice skills. Let's start using these tools, but let's make sure that we're doing so in a thoughtful way, um, especially as this is a wild frontier, the tools are evolving very rapidly. So we wanna make sure we're doing so in a responsible way. So what does that look like for real? Again, that's just bullet points. What does it actually look like? So brainstorming assistant, um, asking for that payment gateway case, getting a brainstormed list of questions to ask a product owner. You can also ask these tools to say, what would I ask a, techn a solution architect? What would I ask an enterprise architect? You can actually get some fairly nuanced and detailed um, prompt questions and some initial starting points to help you on your analysis and think about maybe things you haven't considered before. And that can help you prepare for a workshop. And maybe then you could focus on preparing some additional materials and using these questions as a starting point. Also mention access to general knowledge, domain glossary, some of those common acronyms, questioning about that. 
Um, you can get a general list of acronyms. So you can have that as an easy reference for your first conversation with a customer or a stakeholder. And then of course, again, this is pretty exciting for me, especially recently with all the meetings I'm doing, is using tools to accelerate your team tasks. So just an example, Intelligent Meeting re Recap from MS Teams summarizes the, su the suggested notes, the key points of discussion and the tasks. So these things are actually already in place and you can actually already start to leverage them to accelerate your work. But let's think about, again, a bit more about how this looks like. And this is actually a slide I presented almost exactly a year ago when I was talking about starting a career as a business analyst. And I shared what my typical day was. Said I had coffee, checked my email, answered some questions from the team, maybe sent a one or two messages, seeing if the plan needed to change or the meeting agendas needed to change for today. In an agile fashion, we're following um, a safe in this case, having the daily stand up with the team, having some of those core meetings. I work with BAs and team members from Ukraine, from India and elsewhere. So the mornings are usually very busy and we have a lot of meetings with stakeholders and also internally having lunch, can't skip that. And then the afternoon is deeper dives, additional sessions, workshops, interviews, hopefully some time to focus and th plan what the next steps are. Distilling all that information, preparing requirements, drawing diagrams, making summaries, and then getting ready for the next day, booking those meetings, sending out those beating minutes and so forth. So when I was looking at this slide recently, the majority of this is already poised or already ready to be disrupted by AI tools. Everything from that initial email, which could be catching up on my email, which instead I could get a summary potentially showing what uh, were the most critical elements that came in overnight that I need to take a look at to answer questions, having the team members maybe potentially answer some questions themselves based on project documentation, they can more easily search thanks to some of these tools. Meeting minutes and having conversations with the team, those Q and A's, having that brainstormed list of questions could accelerate the preparations for that. And then anything that's in the afternoon or otherwise, all of these tasks could be performed by um, AI tools or at least accelerated by this. So I'm very curious looking at 2024, hopefully I can come back and speak maybe a year from now and say, how much did this actually pan out? And what does actually the BA day look like? And what tools do we leverage in this? And it's still an evolving space um, and we're all trying to adopt these tools responsibly, but it's very exciting to see how this could help accelerate what we typically do. And I'll take a minute or so to just talk about where these things take us further. You've heard from a lot of interesting speakers at this conference already about how we can leverage these tools, where it can disrupt. Um, from the analysis phase, how we manage documentation information, the end solutions we can provide, um, and ultimately how we collaborate. In particular, I'm very excited about reverse engineering because at this point we have a lot of software solutions and business processes that are 20, 30 years old. And oftentimes the people who built them or worked with them are retired and it's a black box that no one knows how it works and they're scared to touch for potentially the right reasons. But how do we actually modernize these things? So reverse engineering, taking the code and actually reverse engineering and distilling business insights from that is actually very personally very exciting to me. But also just analyzing large volumes of data, hundreds of files of old process documentation, being able to go through that and have tools to summarize it and so forth is also exciting. And again, all of this leads to the fact that it's an accelerator and it allows you to spend more time on what matters. And of course, we've all heard about this new productivity tools speed up our work and then we have more time for things. And actually, it's true. We can accomplish more in a single day than you could even 10 years ago. And I think that that's a very exciting uh, potential, especially because the technology is evolving and accelerating rate. So now it's crystal ball time. What does our future as BAs look like? What do our roles and our teams look like? And I'll admit it is entirely possible that this could be debunked in two months. It's a rapidly evolving space. And actually I'd be very excited to find out that my hypotheses uh, are invalidated and would love to learn about what that could be. But we have to start with something. We have to start with some mental models, some ideas um, to help guide our explorations and innovations. So first off, let's think about what is the BA role in the classic SDLC, the software development life cycle. This is grossly silver simplified. Anyone familiar with SAFE and Agile knows it's a bit more of an iterative process, but 
realistically, especially when a team is up and rolling, it's a bit of a pipeline. You have those initial stakeholders that you're working with, identifying their needs, their problems. BAs, of course, we're, we're superheroes. We do our work in collaborating with them and we ultimately translate what's needed into requirements, aligning with architects and or for the technical solution aspects and doing that feedback loop there. But ultimately we're defining what do we need to change? What do we need to do? Development life cycle, testing and so forth, deployment, hopefully reaching something that provides some form of end value for our stakeholders, their customers and so forth. So the question I raise is this, with these tools where requirements can be written up based on a misspelled single sentence, could you not go from stakeholders and their needs straight to requirements? Could you not have your requirements more easily translatable directly into actionable code or tend or automated test cases? We already see this in some case in with some applications where business you and business users can configure tools and set up business rules and so forth. But this ability to not be limited by particular platforms is very exciting. And the ability to potentially bypass a large part of those activities because we have these accelerating tools that can actually under at least understand our intent and translate into a format that's actionable by the next step in the process without necessarily involving a human is exciting and also a little scary because does that make us a middle person that's redundant? And that's always an interesting question. And I'm su it's surprising how often I'm asked, why do we need a business analyst on a project? And you go back to defining needs, bridging the gap. That's very important here. But I think it's important to be conscious about where we stand. We translate insights and information. We're using our expertise and we're translating it into something actionable, different format. There's definition, there's solutioning and, and so forth, but ultimately we're translating, processing, analyzing, and then bringing it out. And of course, we're supporting stakeholders and teams throughout this whole process, but there's some aspects of what we do that potentially could be optimized. So that's a little doom and gloom and scary. And I don't necessarily think that the BA role is gonna be going away. However, I think we need to be conscious of what our role is in our teams and what the what work we do and really try to find out how we can deliver value in this new paradigm now that we're leveraging AI tools. So here are a few ideas. The first is being that prompt engineer. So as we're taught, as some of the panels were talking about the previous uh, chat, BAs are oftentimes able to help bridge the gap between stakeholders, between stakeholders and teams and so forth and help define their needs. So actually supporting our stakeholders and learning how to leverage AI tools in learning how to work with these is actually potentially a natural role for BAs. Many of us are very technical in nature, so we can understand the limitations of the technology and help guide our teams and how to use them more effectively. So from the example where I was helping someone plan their travel holiday, they were a little flustered, like, how do I use this tool? And I said, just talk to me. Just talk as if you're just asking me, we're having a conversation. And then I, was, I set up that prompt and then was able to get um, some useful insights for them. The second area where we can evolve is actually that acceleration of the SDLC pipeline, where requirements more and more could be potentially directly translated to code. This could help with prototyping. So potentially you want to set up an application. Uh, you want to set up an application to do some A-B testing or something like that. Imagine having a BA where they can start defining and using tools to create those prototypes with less lag time. You could actually create a clickable prototype much more quickly than some of the existing tools we have. Also, with any new disruptive technology, there are consultants. Um, but the but in particular, because this is such a disruptive wave, there's going to be new needs. There's going to be new problems. We have to under support our stakeholders and our customers in not only how do they transform their business and their products and their offerings to their end users and their customers, but also internally for ourselves. How do we coach and work with our own teams? to help accelerate and leverage these tools. And this is something where as BAs, understanding stakeholders, knowing personas, um, understanding how to define needs, look being creative with finding solutions, that's something that we're actually naturally adept at. So I think that there's a good opportunity here for BAs to really sort of leverage our skills in supporting that consultancy. And last but not least, this is actually something that was always here, but being that creative engine on the teams, asking why five times over and over to really understand 
what the true problem is and moving forward with this. Generative AI is wonderful. And certainly it can ask a lot of prompting questions and lead to some really interesting insights, but it does have limitations based on current knowledge and how it's been trained, what data set it's been trained on and so forth. So it's always gonna be critical for someone, and I think in particular the BAs are well posed for this, to inject that creativity. And as we settle into our new paradigms, using these tools and updating our ways of working, we need to ensure that we're constantly challenging these paradigms, not just in what we do, but how we do it. So with that thought about how our roles could evolve and the titles may say the same or they may change a little bit, prompt engineer or otherwise, there may be some new ones. How do we actually get there? What does that look like? And again, we're still in crystal ball mode team, but there's a few steps to this. The first is that awareness. We're all here today talking about AI. So I think check, we've all got that general awareness um, of the AI and opportunities. And many of us, likely hopefully everyone here, has already started experimenting, had that moment and it, trying to play with the tools and understand them a little bit better. And then at this point, we're, we're starting to get to that point where we're starting to individually accelerate ourselves maybe still working as we do, having the same meetings, having the same interactions, but starting to accelerate the work we're doing as business analysts, leveraging these tools. But then as we get more comfortable with using these tools ourselves, expanding the horizon, how do we work and up, how do we work as teams? How do we work in our organization? How do we leverage these tools, not just as individuals, but as larger groups? And ultimately that leads to some AI native proficiency. So similar to the digital native where Searching on the internet is something natural and extension of what you do. Leveraging these tools will also be natural and something we do. And this is where, depending on how they're integrated into our existing applications and, and tools and ways of working, it may be more transparent or not. And that's going to be something interesting to see. But ultimately, being comfortable and using these tools in the toolkit as easily as you'd reach for a calculator to do a complicated calculation or searching online um, to get an answer to a question. And from here, who knows, the AI singularity, Skynet, um, and so forth, but certainly there's definitely an evolution beyond this and it's not strictly a linear path. As the, as the tools evolve, as our understanding evolves, as new products come out, as there's new demands opened up in the market, we will tumble back down in our understanding. What abilities we build even over the, over the current month um, may actually fall out of date in a few weeks because the technology is advancing that rapidly. So we need to be accepting, accepting of the fact that it's okay to go back to that bumbling stage. And we need to be constantly experimenting because of this rapidly and exponentially evolving um, technology. And throughout all this, I wanna emphasize, we're continuing to educate ourselves. We're continuing to share knowledge, like we are at this, this conference over the last couple of days, and also supporting each other as a community as we evolve as a business analysis practice. And from the top end, there's open questions and I don't necessarily have the answers to these, but we need to think about what is the role of a BA on the team? The true scrum fashion where there's no defined roles. Now, when you have tools that enable anyone to potentially write straight to code, what does that look like? What does the career path look like for a junior BA? Then there's other questions that we don't even know at this time. And I'll leave you with the last couple of thoughts here. So talked about that evolving BA understanding from that initial awareness to that acceleration to that AI native business analyst and the new opportunities and titles that that could represent. But ultimately, what, what can you do to maybe get there or at least start your journey? Being curious, being here is actually already the first step. So being curious and educating yourself uh, is a critical part of this. Curiosity did not kill the cat in this case. You can do experiments but do so responsibly. Um, be aware of the current regulatory environment, be aware of security and privacy. Let's do it responsibly and not recklessly, but at the same point, don't let that hold you back from trying out some samples, working with some ideas, looking, researching some of the latest tools that are coming up and continuing those explorations. Think about these things. Ask yourself, your fellow BAs, your teams, your organizations, how can we accelerate ourselves using these tools? yourself in how you do your work day to day, but also accelerating your business and how you actually are going to find new solutions and approaches to offering your products or addressing this stakeholder needs and so forth. There's a lot of opportunity for innovation disruption. Certain solutions were science fiction, 
but now actually are potentially more of a reality than ever before. So let's let's go through with that. And lastly, share. Share what you discovered. Uh, we'd like we're here today because we are sharing what we all learned and our current experimentations and our thoughts about where we see things go. But we'd love to see at a future conference, potentially one of you sharing what you discovered and learned so that as a BA practice, as a BA community globally, we can support each other in navigating these disruptive waves and these opportunities. So with that, I'm going to leave you with last message. Paradigm shifts are potentially a little uncomfortable, but it's important to challenge them. And in this case, the we mentioned our ways of working are constantly evolving. The only constant in all of this is change. And as I mentioned, what I presented here could fall out of date. But we do have to accept it's changing, so why not embrace it? And with that, I want to say thank you very much for your time and joining me in this talk today. I'm very excited to answer your questions and chat with you. And if you want to continue the conversation, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, I would love to connect with you and hear your ideas. And if you want to know a little bit more about what myself and our team at EPAM are doing in, in evolving our services solution, the artificial intelligence space, and some of the opportunities we see there, you can also check out the link there. So thank you very much. And let's hear some good questions. Thank you, Catherine, for, for such an inspiring session, I can say. And now we can open our Q&A session. And I can see one question from our audience. And um, I suppose that you have already answered, but just to sum up, uh, I suppose. Uh, how do you invent, uh, envision to demand for BAs taking into account that even, for, uh, even before AI, sometimes it was difficult to justify for some clients that um, the value of uh, BA that uh, BA will bring something new to their project and uh, how you can justify to your clients that BA is still needed. <laughs> it's the existential question and absolutely and I've, I've had to do a PowerPoint presentation explaining why BAs are important. Um, it goes back to that fundamental aspect of bridging the gap. Um, certainly in a perfect world you have just a product owner creating stories and you know, a team potentially developing a solution. However, realistically, a person who's a product owner who can help drive the direction of a product or a solution doesn't always have the time. So oftentimes having a BA partner who can help accelerate those conversations, accelerate that requirements and, and definition of need and solution and so forth is actually very valuable on teams. Um, so that's actually one of the things you could look at is saying is that Yes, in a perfect world, you know, do we really need BAs? Our product owners could do everything. Oftentimes, the most valuable product owners are those who are actually in the business. They're delivering value and they have a lot of work that they're doing um, to drive their organization. So potentially they may not have as much time with the team. So being a proxy product owner is one good selling point for a BA, but also just from the skills that we offer. Again, thinking back to defining those needs and recommending the solutions. We have, a many, we have a massive toolkit of techniques to help us uncover and define those needs, how to break them down in a way that can actually be actioned on and understood by everyone involved from business, IT, development teams, and so forth. And then we can work, especially from a technical perspective, we can work to evaluate and build solutions that actually can meet the values and balance out all the different business constraints. And that's something where AI tools and such can certainly support. But especially for the near future, that's something where BAs still drive a lot of value. Thank you. And our next question, I can say it will be a short story or some feelings of our colleague. And I just would like to read and perhaps you can uh, share some insights that you will have after. Um, in order to use AI for many BA processes, we would, uh, we would need client approval to feed the input to these systems, which is a huge question at this moment. Imagine the pain when you know that you work on something two days, uh, which may can be done in a few hours but you cannot since AI cannot be used. That's actually a really good point. And I think the key piece is we have to be responsible in our usage. And as the tools are rapidly evolving, um, different organizations have taken different approaches to risk, um, the risk posed by using these tools. And it is frustrating because you can see the, something that can really save you pain and accelerate your work. And I know the feeling. Um, and then you want to actually start leveraging it. Um, in part, that depends on the context of your organization that you work in. Uh, from an EPAM perspective, we've been working on tools to help address that problem directly. How do we potentially use these tools without 
um, causing issues, but it has to be in close correlation with your customers and understanding that in transparency, we understand what our ways of working are, what tools are we using, are we meeting the security and privacy requirements is absolutely important. So yes, it's a little bit frustrating, but I would also say still experiment. You can experiment in using dummy data, example, example cases and so forth, because don't worry, there are folks working very hard in the background to address those problems and learn how to bring AI and AI tools into the organization. And when that does, it's going to go off like a rocket ship and they're going to say, so BAs, are you ready? So you can do your experiments again in a responsible way. But um, that issue about not being allowed to use the tools and such is going to be addressed very rapidly.